Welcome, friends, to another Global Capitalism, a presentation every other month that is organized by two organizations. Democracy at Work is one, and the Left Forum is another. You can find out what both of these organizations do by visiting their websites, leftforum.org and democracyatwork.info. Before jumping into today's presentation, I wanted to let you know about another joint product of Left Forum and Democracy at Work. It's a session of classes, four to be precise, four consecutive Monday afternoons, four to six. I offer them, I teach them, and I would be interested to see if some of you might like to participate. We just finished one last month called Understanding Socialism, and the one coming up that begins on November 13th and then runs three more Mondays after that is called Understanding Marxism. It's an in-depth look at the history of Marxism, what it's all about, who are the main thinkers, what were the activities on the one hand and the theoretical workings out of the critique of capitalism that the Marxists, the Marxist tradition, developed over the last 120 years, roughly speaking. So this is a chance, if you're interested in Marxism, to get an introduction over a four-week period. The book that we use is my own book called Understanding Marxism, which is available at the Democracy at Work website. Okay, the topic today is the socialist tradition and its relationship to capitalism. I think you will find it a new and different way of understanding the relationship here. It is very different from what has traditionally been said, but it also captures and summarizes much of the self-critical thinking of socialists over the last 30 years. It's been a particular time, those 30 years, of rethinking and criticizing the history of socialism because it comes after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of what was the best known, the longest lasting experiment with socialism that we had had historically up until this period of time. So the period since 1989 up until the present is a period of severe self-criticism, self-reflection, and new kinds of thinking. And I want to bring you up to date, if you're not already there, with what that has meant, and I think you will find it arresting in its implications. So let's jump right in. Capitalism, and I want to begin by a simple definition that we will be working with. Capitalism is a way of organizing the production and distribution of goods and services. It's a particular way, in short, of organizing your economy. Unlike slavery, which had masters and slaves, or feudalism that had lords and serfs, or ancient village economies that had neither slavery nor feudalism, capitalism is a particular way of organizing production and distribution. It's not slavery. There are no slaves. It's not feudal. There are no serfs. It's not an ancient village in almost any way you can think of. What is it? It is a way of organizing that positions a relatively small number of people, two or three percent of a population, usually not much more, that are in a position to control, to organize, to oversee, to own a business. And then there's a mass of people who work in and for that business. 
So that capitalism, you might say, is the system of employer-employee. Employers with the power, employers who accumulate the wealth, and employees who work for the employer, producing the wealth and getting a wage or a salary for doing so. You're all familiar with that because we all live in it. And we have, in most cases, all our lives. This capitalist system came into existence in the 17th, 18th centuries in England and then in Europe, and from there spread to become the dominant global system today. You find employers and employees as the basic organization of production and distribution in most of the world, not all of it, but most of it today. This capitalist system, from its beginnings, had all kinds of problems. That's not unique. Every economic system that we have any record of likewise had its particular problems and weaknesses and difficulties throughout its history. The various systems had different weaknesses and problems, and they resolved or worked on them differently. And that gave each of them their own unique history for the centuries that they lasted. And then every one of them passed away, died, and in so doing, give birth to a new and a different one. Slavery came out of a previous system. Feudalism came out of one. Capitalism came out of slavery or feudalism or still other economic systems. But capitalism always had problems and difficulties. And that meant it always had people living in capitalism who looked at those weaknesses and difficulties and struggled about how to understand them and what to do about them. In all economic systems, people did that. Some people loved the system in all systems. They celebrated it. They praised it. They were grateful for it. That was true in slavery. That was true in feudalism. That's true in capitalism, of course, as well. We all know all kinds of people, all kinds of media that celebrate capitalism one way or another. And some of these celebrators were so committed to the capitalist system that they felt either that the weaknesses and flaws weren't there, that's the really kind of over-the-top people who love capitalism, they love it so much they can't literally see its flaws and weaknesses. Then there are those who see them, but reassure others and themselves that's nothing to worry about because the system has built into itself the abilities to overcome whatever problems and weaknesses show up. These are very celebratory people. They admire a capitalism, not least because of its mechanisms of overcoming its problems. Then there are the people who are not so celebratory. And again, this is true in all systems, but we're focused on capitalism. So there are people who are not able to make believe there are no flaws or weaknesses. And there are people who don't admit flaws and weaknesses only to reassure everybody that they're self-correcting. There are people who feel about capitalism, that they are its victims, that the flaws and weaknesses of capitalism hurt large numbers of people. And in capitalism, we all know and you all know who those folks are and what their complaint is, because it's always been the same basic ones. Here we go. 
capitalism, the victims argue, leaves a good number of us poor. Poor. And we stay poor. The poor are always with us, as older traditions have also claimed. But if capitalism is a system that promised, when it came in, to eradicate poverty, if it did, well, it hasn't kept its promise. We are remarkable, we capitalist people, in producing wealth. But unfortunately, we are equally skilled at perpetuating poverty. And the victims of that quality of capitalism, the poor, don't like it, would prefer a system that didn't keep them and their children and their children children poor. And even if the children and the children's children stop being poor, did not immediately bring in other people to take the role of the poor. So that's always been a critique of capitalism, that it, to say the same thing in other words, distributes wealth unequally, unfairly, undemocratically. Here's the second critique, that the system is deeply and fundamentally unstable. That's right. Every few years, the National Bureau of Economic Research says every four to seven years, on average, capitalism has a crash, breaks down. Suddenly, large numbers of people are thrown out of work, not because of the work they do being of low quality, not at all. These are people who have often been working there for years, doing perfectly good work and praised by their employer, but they're fired. And the business, which was doing well, collapses. Bankruptcy, unemployment. And of course, if businesses are going bankrupt and workers are losing their job, neither of them can pay taxes. So the local government cannot help people because it has less revenue just at the moment of unemployment when they need more. System isn't very well worked out, is it? This instability disrupts people's lives, forces people in school to quit school to go back home and help a family in economic distress. You carry the the scars of economic downturns through much of the rest of your life. Much of the 20th century is filled with people writing the stories of how the Great Depression of the 1930s affected their family. The Grapes of Wrath, one of the great novels of that period in the United States, is all about the devastation caused in and by the Great Depression. And here we are in the new century with three crashes already under capitalism's belt. The dot-com crash in 2020, the so-called Great Recession of uh, 2008 and 2009, and now the so-called COVID-19 crash of 2020 and 2021. And in each of those, millions of people across the world lost their jobs. Hundreds of thousands of businesses, large and small, collapsed. Remarkable instability. And people who have been victimized by that instability or people who have observed what it has done to societies, they're the ones who become critics of capitalism. They see its flaws. They see its weaknesses. And they are not persuaded, not at all, that the system self-corrects. If anything, they point to the fact that we have had unequal distributions of wealth and unequal distributions of income across the history of capitalism from its beginning to right this minute. The system doesn't overcome that problem. It doesn't self-correct, these folks say. 
And ditto, if we were supposed to have overcome our instability, our up and down economy, well, we haven't been able to do that either. If you pick up today's financial news, it's all about when the next recession downturn is going to hit, with the debate being before the end of 2023 or in 2024. Capitalists kind of know it's not a question of when the next crash happens. Excuse me, it's not a question of whether the next crash happens. It's only a question of when. This is the background then for the question what to do about it. And that question leads us right into socialism, what it means, how it relates to all of this. On the simplest level, we can begin this way. Those people who either felt to be the victims of capitalism or the critics of capitalism, the ones who saw the flaws and weaknesses, felt aggrieved by them, believed that we must be able to do better than a system that works with these flaws and these weaknesses. Those people began to look for how, well, this is the key issue now, for look to see how could you save capitalism by fixing the flaws and weaknesses that the system couldn't fix by itself. How could you do for this system? And by system, again, we mean the employer-employee arrangement for producing and distributing resources and products. How could you save capitalism, once cleverly put, from itself, from its own weaknesses? And the answer people found, overwhelmingly, was to turn to the state, to the government, to see in the government the final savior, if you like. And I choose the words with an awareness of the overtones of such a term. The government as the savior of a capitalism that could not save itself. Let me give you examples. Employers and employees locked in this relationship called capitalism, where the mass of people work for a relatively small number of people and watch as the wealth of the small number grows and theirs doesn't. Watch as though, as if the CEO were like a king inside the enterprise with extraordinary authority and no accountability to the mass of employees whom the employer can hire and fire pretty much at will. Especially in the United States. So the idea became, can we get the government to fix this? Let's start with the case of inequality. First idea, government redistribute wealth. That's right. Government come in and take steps to remove the wealthy from all that wealth and pass it instead to all those employees or people without a job who have no wealth at all. The redistribution of wealth was one of the first things, and it is still to this day, one of the major things critics of capitalism, victims of capitalism, look to to fix things. And you know the mechanisms. I'm not going to go through them. Perhaps the most famous one is the tax system. You tax more from the rich than you do from the poor, and you use the money to help the poor more than the rich who, after all, don't need it. 
And there are a thousand different taxing schemes that have been tried and used and continually finely tweaked to do this kind of work. And this is saving capitalism from itself. What the government is doing is saying, look, uh, capitalism has distributed wealth so unequally that the people who are victims and critics are upset. And we need to do something because if we don't, in their upset, they may, uh oh, here we go, change the system, decide we don't accept capitalism anymore. It's not that we're critical of its uh, weaknesses and flaws. It's that we won't tolerate them anymore. So th we don't want to get to that period. We don't want capitalism to go. That's really the impulse here. We want to keep it. We think employers, employees is the okay way to organize. Maybe we even think it's the best way to organize production and distribution. So we don't want to lose it. And so we better redistribute wealth because that fixes a flaw in the system, which if you don't fix it, will threaten that system with having to give way to another system. Here's a second example, just as powerful. People have said we have to do something about the instability of this system. The fact that every four to seven years on average, it crashes. Sure, some of the crashes don't affect all that many people and don't last all that long, but others of them affect many millions of people and last for years. The Great Depression of the 1930s, produced an unemployment rate of 25% in 1933 and lasted 11 years. Nor has anything happened to make that less of a risk these days. So guess what? People who wanted to save capitalism from its own instability, save capitalism from itself, undertook to try to develop a whole new economics to try to understand why the system is so unstable. And there's a name for that economic system. It's the name of the individual who kind of invented it. The British economist John Maynard Keynes developed something now called Keynesian economics, which is, to make a complicated story brief, how the government can come into a capitalism and manipulate its monetary system and manipulate government spending and taxes in such a way as to fix the problem of instability, to make the ups and downs last less of a period of time and be less severe than they would otherwise have been. There's capitalism saving itself again because the government is going to reduce instability, just like a moment ago we talked about how the government could reduce inequality and thereby make the system more tolerable to the people who live in it because the government fixed, at least to some degree, the weaknesses and the flaws. Saving capitalism from itself. Now comes the interesting part. From the beginning, capitalism also, in addition to having the people who loved and celebrated it, and now as we see the people who were felt victimized by and critical of capitalism, there was another group, small at the beginning, but have got steadily larger since then, who felt that the system probably couldn't be fixed. They at least worried about it. They were the ones who wanted to go the furthest in redistributing wealth and income. They were the ones who wanted to go the furthest and having the government come in a la Keynes and to lessen the instability. 
They were the ones who felt only with the governments constantly being involved could you limit these flaws and weaknesses and the injustices and the absence of a democratic equality that they saw in capitalism all the time. These people took a name. It's not interesting for the moment why they picked this name, but they picked it. They called themselves socialists. They were interested in society. But in terms of what we are talking about, what they meant was they really wanted either to save capitalism from itself or to do better than capitalism, to maybe change the system. And before I now show you how the entire history of socialism is wrapped up in this question, how do we fix capitalism and its associated, why do we want to fix capitalism question? Before I do that, I'm going to give you a parallel chosen from American history because I think it'll help make the point clear. Slavery in the United States always had the people who accepted it, liked it, admired it, felt it was God's will, very positive towards it. And it always had people who were critical, who felt victimized, obviously amongst the slaves for sure, but who also felt critical that the world could do better than this. And um, between the struggles to keep it by those who loved it and to fix it by those who saw its flaws and weaknesses, what did we see emerge? Well, let's call it an anti-slavery movement. But the anti-slavery movement was interestingly complicated. There were some who expressed their hostility to slavery by demanding better food, better clothing, less disruption of slave families, less beating of slaves, less sexual abuse of slaves. They wanted to deal with the flaws and failures and weaknesses and horrors of slavery by fixing it. But notice, in everything I've just said, there's not a word about the institution itself. These were people who didn't question that some would be masters and some would be slaves, that a few were masters and many were slaves. They questioned only how the master treated the slave. That is what they meant by anti-slavery. But then there were people who went further. They didn't want there to be slavery at all. They didn't want to improve the condition of a slave if it left them a slave. They wanted to change and free the slave so that the slavery as an institution was gone. Well, here come now the socialists in relationship to capitalism. Very similar. These socialists who saw the flaws and weaknesses, they often became people who advocated fixing the flaws and weaknesses without challenging, without questioning, without disputing the employer-employee organization of production and distribution. In a word, they didn't turn against capitalism. They wanted to fix it, to overcome its flaws and weaknesses. And you know what? They saw the government as the agency to do it. They're the ones who want the government to come in and to Take the steps to reduce inequality, reduce poverty, overcome the, the ups and downs of the economy, have a provision for older people, a pension system, all the rest of it that you're familiar with. They wanted the government to come in and humanize, soften, make less harsh capitalism. They wanted to fix capitalism by bringing the government in. 
Then there were those who said, that's not enough. We have to go further. And here's what we're going to propose. The government shouldn't just come in and make it a little bit better. The only way the government can make sure, in the end, that people get paid better than they were getting paid, that we don't have periods of recession, depression, unemployment, and all the miseries that go with it. And that the only way to do that is if the government takes over and runs the enterprises. The government organizes the production and distribution of goods and services. That was another kind of socialist response to capitalism weaknesses. And now let's put some names on these socialisms. The first kind where the government comes in and regulates and controls, but otherwise does not interfere, that's often called Scandinavian socialism or democratic socialism or socialism or socialist democracy or Western European socialism, even though it exists in many parts of the world. The businesses are still owned and operated by private individuals. Private capitalism is the economic system, but it is overseen, supervised, regulated by the government, whose job it is to lessen the flaws and weaknesses so that the basic system, employers and employees, is saved from itself, for itself. The second one, when the government comes in and takes over, that's what happened in the Soviet Union. It can and should be called Soviet socialism. In that system, the government took a further step. It did affect the distribution of wealth and income, for sure. It did affect the bouncing up and down of capitalism. It did guarantee full employment all the time. It did all those things, but it did it without allowing private capitalism to survive. It didn't allow in industry. It did allow it in agriculture, but it didn't allow it in industry. Remarkable. That's another way of, of handling it. Then we have a hybrid of those two, a third kind of socialism that's a 50-50 split of the first two. It says, well, let's not go all the way and have the government run everything. Let's not go all the way to Soviet socialism, but let's go further than the Scandinavian or Western European socialism, and that's the People's Republic of China, which is literally roughly 50-50 split between private capitalist enterprises and state-owned and operated enterprises. All of these three call themselves socialists. The governments in Europe that put together the first kind, those were socialist governments, governments in which the socialist parties of their societies had won the elections alone or in coalitions and made those things happen. Just like in Russia, it was a revolution that brought a socialist and a communist party into power to create Soviet socialism. And by the way, the Soviets called what they did a kind of socialism, just like the socialist parties in Europe then and now call what they do socialism. And China's official self-description these days is socialism with Chinese characteristics. And that those characteristics are the hybrid, a very powerful communist party at the top, supervising and regulating 50% government-owned and operated enterprises, 50% private capitalist enterprises. Each of these kinds of socialism have two things in common that I want you to see and understand. Number one, each of them addresses, defines itself as having the goals of making the flaws and weaknesses of capitalism less burdensome, less horrible, less extreme than they were before under capitalism and would be if capitalism came back. They promise that. They insist that they do that. They point to their achievements as having done that. 
So, for example, socialists in Western Europe point to the fact that most Western European countries provide free education for their people all through the university, too, as a fruit of their socialism. That the national health care service that they provide to all their people is a fruit of their socialism. That the job protections are likewise. That the fact that a, a worker in France or Germany is given by law five weeks of paid vacation every year is a fruit of their governments coming in and regulating private enterprise. And the Soviet Union pointed to the fact that it grew from being the poorest part of Europe uh, at the beginning of the 20th century to being the superpower after the United States toward the end of the, se of the 20th century as pointing to what their socialism achieved. The Chinese recently pointed to the fact that they have lifted 800 million people out of poverty over the last 20 years, which the United Nations corroborates they did. And they say, look what socialism is able to do. Chinese communism, excuse me, Chinese capitalism never did such a thing. So there they are, three efforts to fix the flaws and failures of capitalism. But the second thing they all have in common is the fact that they saved capitalism from itself and for itself. Why? What do I mean? In every one of those systems, Western European socialism, Soviet socialism, Chinese socialism, with important differences among them, I've tried briefly to summarize. Nonetheless, they all kept the employer-employee organization of production. They didn't do away with that. They didn't see that as a priority problem to overcome. They didn't see that as the root of the very flaws and failures that they saw and reacted to, but they didn't think it was appropriate or necessary to go after the organization of production, the employer-employee system. That they all continued. That they all preserved. And that leads me to this conclusion for you to think about. The irony, if you like, that the socialist movement, starting so powerfully across the 19th century, spreading globally across the 20th century, that that socialist movement, critical of capitalism, facing its flaws and weaknesses, organizing around and to overcome them, had the ironic result of going quite far in reducing those flaws and failures, helping generations of the poor, lessening the horrors of capitalism's instability, reducing in many ways the gross injustices of a capitalism before and without them, that at the same time that that has to be said and honored, there's also the need to be critical. They did not see that the core of capitalism, the unique thing about it, that employer-employee relationship that distinguishes it from every other economic system, is also a root cause of those flaws and failures, and has to be addressed. And the implication of what I'm saying is that the fourth kind of socialism, not Western Europe, Scandinavian, not Soviet, not Chinese, the fourth kind of socialism, which is emerging as we speak inside all of the other socialisms, and globally as well, 
is a socialism that prioritizes precisely what the other three socialisms overlooked, missed, marginalized, undervalued. The fourth kind of socialism goes right after the employer-employee relationship, pinpoints that as the core that hasn't changed, that has kept inequality, instability, injustice, lack of real democracy, because it is the enemy of all of those things. That's why socialists could only go so far in reducing inequality and not much further. That's why they couldn't do much about the instability. That's why they couldn't bring a genuine democracy allowing the rich everywhere to buy the political oppositions to weaken them. Socialism, by bringing the state in, in the way that they did in Scandinavia, the Soviet Union, and now China, did in fact preserve capitalism. Limited it, reshaped it in important ways. No disrespect here for all the positive changes socialists in all the three basic kinds, Scandinavian, Soviet, and China, all that they did for their people, no disrespect here, no denial of that, no rejection of it. Whatever the other criticisms one can make of all societies, including all of them, all those socialist societies, and there are criticisms of their human rights records, of their civil liberties, and of many other things. They were movements to address, above all, the flaws, the weaknesses, the inequality, the instability of capitalism, and they went a very significant way right along what they had promised to do. But that does not relieve them or us from the need to ask the same question. Why are the flaws and weaknesses of capitalism not gone? Why were there limits to what could be done? Why are there even signs in recent decades of a growing inequality, certainly inside most countries, and certainly no end? of the instabilities. The three we've had in this new century are among the worst of capitalism's four centuries of history. So things are not looking real good. Yes, the gains in social services from the government are remarkable and worth fighting for, past and present. But there are questions that have to be asked inside every society, whether the state plays a large role, a medium role, or very little of a role, whether we're talking UK and US or People's Republic, Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, and so on. And then the important thing, that many, many socialists understand both the achievements they can be proud of and the limits that they need to face honestly in light of the fact that those earlier experiments, certainly in Scandinavia and Western Europe, have been undone in recent decades and look to be more undone now, that the Soviet Union is in a completely different place having lost much of what had been gained in the Soviet period, and so on. That China produces billionaires second only to the United States is a problem to be faced honestly. And there are socialists doing that. And they have produced now a new socialism, that fourth kind that wants to transform the workplace 
by getting rid of the employer-employee relationship. It's unfair, it's undemocratic, and it is a block to the achievement of what the whole socialist movement set itself to do. And in that way, we go back to the slavery example. The people who are talking about transforming workplaces so that they become democratic communities of working people, one person, one vote, with all decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits that all of the workers together have produced, to make all that a democratic decision, that there are no employers separate from the employees, that the employees are their own employer, individually their employees, but collectively they're the workforce and the employer. The dichotomy, master, slave, lord, serf, employer, employee, is put aside. It's over historically, and it will be replaced by a democratized, democratized workplace. And it will then have the position, the authority, and the resources since it commands the economics of the system to make sure, finally, that we don't have extreme inequality. We never allow unemployment to disrupt or destroy lives and that democracy becomes real because it isn't limited anymore to politics and political life, but is introduced into the economy and economic life where it should have been all along. And here's a footnote, if you like, that only makes the point stronger. The footnote is, where does fascism fit into all of this. Fascism, too, is a recognition on the part of many that capitalism, left to itself, has failures and flaws. But the belief of the fascist is that the failures and flaws of capitalism are imported into it by outside elements. And that the way to make capitalism survive, the way to save capitalism from its own flaws and failures, is to make sure that those flaws and failures, which it only has because of bad outside influences, are taken care of, are ameliorated, are fixed. And the way to do that, say the fascists, is to get rid of the outside influences that mess up what capitalism does and is. And so fascists seek to take over the society, not the way socialists do to reduce inequality, to reduce in instability, and so on. But they have a completely different idea, which is similar only in that they want the state to take a powerful position. There, they agree with the socialists, but for completely different reasons and in the service of completely different goals. What fascism does is deliver the conditions that might allow private capitalism to actually live up to its positive self-image. That's why fascists are so either so eager, almost always, to identify the evil elements in the community that make capitalism have problems. You see, it isn't really capitalism that has the problems the fascists teach us. No, 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 no. It's outside agitators, unions, 
that shouldn't be allowed to intervene between workers and capitalists. It's immigrants that bring in with them bad attitudes, bad habits, bad religious beliefs. And the fascists are going to clean all that up, push out the immigrant, get rid of the labor union, remove all those social barriers, all those social conditions that make capitalism work not as well as it could and it should. The fascists therefore come in and create the conditions that they believe the capitalists need in order to be socially positive, socially acceptable. By the way, that's why business interests are always behind fascism. It's always businesses that fund the fascists. Because for them, that kind of state intervention is infinitely preferable to the kind from socialists. The socialists want the government to do all kinds of things that capitalists are not interested in. The fascists like that the capitalists welcome them, and the capitalists welcome them because they're going to get rid of unions, they're going to get rid of critics, they're going to get rid of immigrants while making the domestic working class prisoner because it has no unions. That's what Hitler did. That's what Mussolini did. That's who they were. That's what they did. So notice, the government is going to come in and save capitalism for itself by getting rid of the social impurities that can allow a beautiful capitalism to finally overcome its own in a way that always makes them uncomfortable, the libertarians share with the fascists this notion that if only you could let capitalism do its thing without external interference, all would be well. The libertarians, thankfully, do not resort to the social horrors of fascism to move in that direction. But their mistake is the same. It's not understanding that the flaws and weaknesses of capitalism come with the system. Let me take a final few minutes to make sure that the implications of all of this are clear. Socialism in three of the four kinds we see in the world today has been a powerful global movement. It arose out of and in response to capitalism, the cause, if you like, of socialism has always been capitalism. If you got capitalism, you're going to get socialism if you haven't got it already. No surprise then to discover that the early efforts of socialism, those of the first two centuries that we've had such a thing as socialism, have seen their efforts go slightly awry in the sense that they ended up being advocates for the government to step in to, to save capitalism from itself, from its own tendencies to produce and reproduce inequality, instability, injustice, and an absence of genuine democracy. And whether they did it, brought the state in as the supervisor for private capitalism, or as the owner and operator of enterprises, as in Soviet socialism, or in the hybrid of those two, the Chinese version of socialism. They made enormous social gains. They improved on capitalism in multiple ways. But in the end, 
despite what they hoped for and thought in the case of many of them, they ended up reinforcing capitalism, saving it from itself by ameliorating the inequalities, by ameliorating the instabilities, by ameliorating the injustices. They saved that system. But they also engendered a self-criticism among them. Hegel's old dialectic that led them to understand they had overlooked, omitted, omitted the focus on the core of capitalism, that human relationship between the employer and the employee, that they had left unchanged, untheorized, unquestioned, so that it was reproduced in state enterprises no different from private enterprises. Well, I should amend what I said. I said unquestioned. Not true. There have always been voices among the socialists who did question it. And none more profoundly than Karl Marx. And if you ever look at Karl Marx's Das Kapital, his major work of his mature period of time, all of the early volume one chapters are all about the detailed relationship between the employer and the employee. It's in those early chapters that he defines that relationship as a process in which the employer extracts from the employee a surplus that the employee is constrained to produce more value for the employer than the employer pays the worker for the labor being done. And in that difference, that extra, what the worker produces over and above for the employer, what the employer gives him back, there is the wealth of society. There is the growth. There is the built-in expansion, which the employer, of course, keeps and uses for his own purposes to enhance his wealth. Right there, a relationship Marx defines as exploitation. Marx is telling us, this is the issue. This is where I begin my work. This is the core of what capital and capitalism mean so that you might draw the inclusion, as I am sure this fourth kind of socialism is now doing, that Marx really was the remarkable thinker that most people recognize, because while he gave birth in his work to all those other kinds of socialism, now that they are in a period of self-criticism after two centuries of work, they return to this remarkable thinker, Marx, to discover what they overlooked that will, I believe, in this century, make the difference between changing capitalism for the better and doing better than capitalism, which will be the reward for all that has gone before. So, in conclusion, all of this leads us to produce, starting November 13th, a series of four classes, two hours each, 4 to 6 p.m., four Mondays in a row, a course that I will teach understanding Marxism that I think you will learn leads directly into this way of understanding the four socialisms that are existing and contesting in the world today. Thank you all for your attention. I would welcome your comments and thoughts about this way of understanding what's been going on these last few decades and years. And in any case, 
I look forward to speaking with you again two months from today, the second Wednesday in January, when we will have the next Global Capitalism presentation.